Last week we kicked off the start of this new series called Everyday Faith because what we want to do is grow in everyday faith because faith is needed every day. And this book is written by James, the brother of Jesus, but he doesn't call himself the brother of Jesus. He calls himself a servant of God and of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And James right away talks about who he's writing this letter to was people who were scattered. The, the first followers of Jesus that were all in Jerusalem, all of a sudden the persecution started of, for being a follower of Jesus and everybody scattered. So James wrote him a letter to say, let me talk to you about how to live out your faith every day. It's extremely practical, and one of the things he says right away is, here's what you do when you handle adversity and uncertainty. And last week, we were uh, very honored to have Mark Adams, the head basketball coach from Texas Tech, come and join us and share his thoughts, and James shared his thoughts about what do you do when suddenly things go south? What do you do when things are difficult? And James says in James 1, 2, to consider it pure joy. We acknowledged it last week. That's not usually what we consider it. We usually consider an inconvenience, a difficulty, a frustration. Really, I don't know how you think about it, but usually this is kind of either a progression or how people respond to a crisis. One, there's denial. We go, it's not a problem. There's no problem here. Nothing to see here. And, 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 or it's just imagine, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, no big deal. Then it's dismissal. It's real, but it's really not that big of a deal. It'll end fast, it won't last, it'll, it'll be over with, nothing to worry about. There, there's a defiance, I refuse to let this limit me or hold me back, which seems good on the surface, but if you're denying what's really going on, it can be unhealthy, but we defy it and say, no, 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 everything is okay, I'm healthy. There's a delayed acceptance where eventually you kind of go, all right, this isn't going away. It is a big deal and it will affect me. It, it usually causes a disruption. We acknowledge that my life has just been altered, maybe even turned upside down or at least turned cattywampus. Is that a word? It is now. And I need to make some tough choices because of it. So suddenly we start to acknowledge it. Then sometimes we raise the red flag and go, it's a, it's a, it's a distress. It's going to last for a long time. And usually, a lot of times when we have that red flag waving, we tend to project how we feel now forever. It's always going to be bad. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to be difficult. The, the best advice that was ever given to me was don't project how you feel today on how it's going to be tomorrow. Things change. Feelings change. How you feel today is not how you're going to feel forever. So beware when you finally acknowledge the distress. Don't project that into the future too far, but call it what it is. And then sometimes there's this level of determination that finally sets in. And I think that's what James was talking about. Consider it pure joy. Like, you're going to get through this, and God's going to actually use this for something good. And then when James said, consider it pure joy, one of the things he said we need to do is keep going and keep growing. And then right away he says, if you ask for, if you need wisdom, ask God for it. Here's what he says in verse 5. We looked at it last week. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God. I don't think it's a coincidence that he said that right after you're going through a crisis. Not because when you go through a crisis, suddenly now you need wisdom. You needed it all along. What a crisis does is it shows us we're not as in control as we thought we were, and we're not as wise as we thought we were. Suddenly we realize life's bigger than me. This is bigger than me, and I need help. When James says wisdom, he's not talking about information. He's not talking about knowledge. He's not even talking about your opinion. What he's talking about is wisdom literally means truth applied. It's the practical side of, of knowledge. Don't get stuck on what we know, but it's actually how you live that out. And James is very big on how will you live out what God's doing inside of you. And basically what he says is you need to grow in wisdom. So ask God for it. It starts with saying, yeah, I'm one of those people that lacks wisdom. That's me. That's sometimes a tough thing to acknowledge, but life has a way of forcing you to admit that. And there's always more wisdom is needed. So how, do we apply, how does God give it to us? I, I, I'm not sure about his side of how he does it, but I do know on our side what we need to do to be on the receiving end of it. And the first thing I would say is what we need to do is, what James says, is just admit it. Admit you lack wisdom. The biggest danger for us receiving God's wisdom is we don't ever say, I really need wisdom. I need God's wisdom. 
The second thing is kind of assess, to admit, you sometimes you need to assess kind of how wise are you? I love doing this exercise in a lot of different areas. And if you've ever interviewed for a job at Live Oak, I asked you this question in the process. Like on a scale of one to 100, sometimes it's how to fully develop are you as a leader? Or in this case, how wise are you? So in your own head, not answering for anybody around you, for yourself, and keep your answer to yourself, but on a scale of one to 100, how wise would you say you are? Remember, wisdom isn't just information, not how smart you are. Wisdom is knowledge applied. How wise are you? Most of us would say, I'm not there yet, but I'm also not, I'm more closer to this side than that side. So usually we kind of say we're right there. But sometimes just saying, this is how wise I am. And really, every time I ask this question, it's never about where you put the X. The only question I ever want to ask is, like, what's your plan to go from here to here? How are you going to grow in wisdom? How are you going to grow as a leader? How are you going to grow as in whatever role you're in? Because usually, none, most of us would acknowledge, I'm not there yet. I could grow in wisdom. But I think sometimes when you assess how wise we are is a start, but also, am I willing to assess and admit that I need God's wisdom, that maybe God's view on things is different than mine and it's better than mine. Admitting it and kind of assessing that we need it is an important step for God giving it. And then after we assess, then we access it. If you lack wisdom, you should ask God. He gives generously, so I need to access the wisdom he's giving. If God's gonna give it, I need to access it. And we have wisdom available from God so often but do we actually seek out and pursue it? And then once we receive God's wisdom, the last thing is to apply it, to live it out every day. And James was very big on this. So was Jesus. Live out. It's not about knowledge. It's not about what you do or what you know. It's what you do, how you live it out. And wisdom is only good when wisdom is applied. And it starts here. Proverbs tells us this. The beginning of wisdom is this. This is where you start. Get wisdom, though it costs you all you have. Get understanding. It comes down to, we talked about this last week, about when you go through difficulty. James says, if you consider it pure joy, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work, so you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Most of us put a higher value on our comfort than we do on our growth. So we don't consider it pure joy. If it costs us something, well, that's, that's more than I want to pay. I would rather invest more in my comfort. What, what this Proverbs is saying here is, if wisdom costs you everything, it's worth it. If you can grow in the wisdom and get God's understanding on things, it's worth it. But most of us value our understanding more than we value God's understanding. We like when God says something that we kind of agree with, but if it tests us and it leads us in a different direction, we don't like that as much. Why? Because we have a higher value on our wisdom than his. You've got to place a high value on God's wisdom. And if you do that, it's as simple as saying this, I'm going to put God first in my life. Now, that's an easy, easier said than done. Because again, if I value God being first in my life, if something cost me it costs me something to follow him because I value that higher, I'll do it. If it costs me to lay down my life or sacrifice something or give something I desire up because God says to go a different direction, I'll do it because it's a value. And if you want to grow in wisdom, you've got to put God first in his life because his wisdom is only good if you trust that he's a good giver of wisdom and his wisdom is from a good God. Psalm 110 goes a little bit further about what the beginning of wisdom is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That word fear of the Lord isn't be afraid of him like he's gonna hit you. It's not like that. It's not be a fear of like afraid of the dark. It's actually like every time I go to the ocean, I think about it. It's having a holy reverence for something, a respect that God is big. There is a God and it's not me. So I'm gonna submit to him. A fear of the Lord means I should be afraid of doing life without him in charge, in charge of my life, that I submit to him. And what the psalmist says is that's where wisdom starts. All who follow his precepts or his commands have good understanding and God gets the credit. To him belongs eternal praise. 
If you want understanding in life, put God first and say, I'm gonna value him more than anything. And if there's a decision to make about what to do, my, my choice will always be, what does God want me to do? Even if it costs me something, it's worth it. Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. He said, seek first his kingdom. To seek first his kingdom, I've got to get out of the throne. I can't be in charge of the, the kingdom of Doug. I've got to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I need to seek first his kingdom as my first priority and his righteousness. And then everything else will take care of itself. We are continually told to put God first and to value him most. So when there's a decision to make, there's no decision to be made. If God wants it, I'll do it. If he commands, I'll say yes. If he leads, I'll follow. Put God first in your life. It's a value statement. And then James gets real practical and he says this, practice God's word in your life. You have to actually do what it says. Go ahead and put that next one up. Practice God's word in my life. Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And then Jesus tells this story of a guy building a house. And the guy who built his house on the rock was the person who heard what Jesus taught and lived it out. Not the person who just heard it, but the person who put it into practice. Not the, it makes any comparison to building a house. You can have the blueprint of what the house looks like, but you actually eventually have to build the house for there to be a house. But here he's talking about the location. And one person builds on the rock, so when something comes, it's got a foundation that it won't knock it over. The other builds it on the sand. They build a beach house. Everyone loves a beach house until there's a hurricane. And when the hurricane comes, the house falls. And Jesus says, you have a choice. And the only variable in this little story he tells is not who hears it. We hear God's wisdom all the time. The variable and the dif difference maker is what will we do with it once we hear it? And Jesus says, put it into practice. It's the right way to live. It's the only way to live. Jesus said a letter to his disciples in John 13. He said this, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. You're not blessed by knowing, you're blessed by doing. And actually that's where your faith proves itself. Because you step out and you go, wow, God really did take care of me through that storm. He really did provide for me. Or his way really was best. It cost me a lot, but the payoff was worth it. That's where faith proves itself. And James, I think, was really, I don't know if, you know, James was, was a follower of Jesus, but he wasn't until after the resurrection. Like, he was a doubter of Jesus before that. And so I don't know if he was at the Sermon on the Mount. But a lot of what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount shows up in the book of James. And James actually says this, which sounds very similar to what his brother Jesus said. In James 1, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Like put it into practice. And for many of us, we know what it means to eat healthy. We know it. And we deceive ourselves and go, well, I think I'm doing a good job because I know what I need to do and I... I feel like I remember a vegetable sometime in the, in the recent past or like, like we do that. We know facts and we kind of deceive ourselves. We trick ourselves and say, well, I know the truth, so I must be good. No, you actually have to follow through and do it to put it into practice. James said this in, in verse one, uh, 25, a little bit later. Whoever looks intently, Looking intently means I'm gonna look in, into God's truth and look at, into his perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it. So it's not just looking, but it's a listening and applying, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. James says the same thing that Jesus did. They'll be blessed in what they do. Again, we talk about this word blessed. It really means a God-given advantage. It is to your advantage. From God, you'll be blessed in what they do. I don't think there's necessarily a disconnect where if I do what God says, he's gonna be a lucky, give me a lucky scratch off at the, at the, at the gas station. Like, like I'll, I'll bless you a little bit. Here's, I'll give you something over here. I think the blessing is tied to the doing. Like when you do what God says, you realize this is to my advantage to live this way. I'm gonna live God's way and not so he gives me some blessing over somewhere else. No, the blessing is right square in the middle of what he's planned for us. Some of it, we know God's will for all of us or certain things. Some of it is very specific in terms of where we live, what we do, relationships, things like that. 
But God has a lot to say, and a lot of it, we know it through Scripture. And James says, you're blessed if you do it. This is the best place to live. This is the rock that when the storm comes, you want your house built on God's truth. But he says, look intently. So what we said earlier, you access it and you apply it. What would it look like for you this week to not just look, but look intently into God's truth? Maybe it's going through a reading plan. Maybe it's just reading a little bit of the Bible every day. Maybe it's listening to a, to a Bible study or a sermon. Maybe it's, well, I don't know what it is for you, but how are you looking intently? And if somebody's followed your habits of connecting to God's truth this week, at the end of the week, would they say, you know what? They really, they're very intently engaging God's word. Or would they say, well, they're doing it habitually, like they're, every day they're doing it, but I don't know, it feels like more of like a check mark. Would they say you look intently or you look casually? Or would they say you don't look at all? Because the secret to where God wants to bless our lives is actually hearing it, accessing it, and then doing it, applying it, and living it out. But it's key, remember, James says you'll be blessed in what they do, but he still said, consider pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Blessing is not going around the trials of life. It's God wisdom, God's wisdom to get you through it, to help you keep going and keep growing. Well, here's one of the ways that I think that God wants us to access wisdom. It's, it's by engaging his word. I think that's key. You look intently into it. But here's one of the other tools that God seems to use. Get some other wise and godly people around you. Proverbs says, walk with the wise, become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. So earlier, I don't know, do you remember your number for one to 100, how wise you thought you were? Do you still remember that number? Raise your hand or nod or um, blink or something so I know you're listening. Like, I, I, okay, now I want you to do that. Again, no talking, but if someone is, if there are people in the room that you're around with on a regular basis, just kind of casually look at them one to 100, how wise are they? Don't tell them, no side comments. One to 100, how wise are they? Okay? And if these are people you do life with, do the math. <laughs> I mean, if you walk with the wise, you're gonna be more wise. Companion of fools, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Somebody scored, saw, I saw somebody score they wrote down for me, through me. Excuse me. <coughs> I may have just lost my voice. Again, look around you. <clears throat> Are the people around you wise? Not smart. Are they godly? They're leaning into God's wisdom. The people around you will shape you. You're gonna be the sum of, of the people you hang out with. God designed us that way. So look around, do the math. Okay, sometimes it's the people around us. Sometimes it's just the people we observe. <clears throat> Here's been a key thing for me. Learn from the lives of others. They don't have to let me into the life. They don't have to let me in to learn something from them. I can learn something from watching how someone lives their life. I can learn from people I've never met. We have biographies. We have the Bible. We can learn from a ton of people of how they live their life following God or sometimes not following him and how it impacted him. <clears throat> this is a key verse for my life. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. The way this guy lived his life showed me if I will look around and learn from it and apply it, from how other people experience life, follow Jesus, have success, have failure. I can learn from their life and God will use that to help me grow in wisdom. I can from the, learn from the lives of others, good or bad. Are you doing that? Because James, what James says is ask God for wisdom, but then just don't sit there passively and wondering, well, how's it gonna happen? Remember what he said in James 1, you know, you ask God for wisdom, but don't merely listen to it 
And so deceive yourselves, do what it says. And he goes a little bit further and he says, anyone who listens to it does not do what, they say, what it says. It's like someone who looks at a face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Like some of us, we look and we listen to what God has to say and then we walk away and it has no impact. It does no good. But then it says this in verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. That's the promise. Access it, apply it, seek God's wisdom, live it out. Be blessed in what you do. But he uses this phrase there, it gives freedom. I think we doubt that. I think we really do. Because sometimes God's wisdom seems to be restricting me from what I want. And God would say, that's a good thing because everything you want is not what's best for you. But I think we doubt this freedom. And actually James gave this warning early on. We skipped over, but I wanna go back and talk about when he says, ask for wisdom and God will give it to you. The very next thing he said, this was in verse six and eight. But when you ask, this is a key to how we ask and how we access and apply it. You must believe and not doubt. And then he says, here's what the person looks like when they doubt. The one who doubts is like a wave on the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. How have you felt the last week? Has it been double-minded? I'm this way and then I'm this way. Have you been tossed around? Like James says, if you wanna really get God's wisdom and apply it, you have to believe and not doubt. And then here's the question I got, got me thinking about. Doubt what? Like, what is it? He doesn't say, but what is the doubt that he warns us against? Because he said, God will give it. That's the promise. But don't doubt. And I think we doubt a lot of things. I think, I mean, the obvious one is we could doubt God. I, I doubt God. I, 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 whether it be, I doubt he exists or I'm not sure if he's real. But I don't think that's what it is. It could be doubting his character or doubting his care for me, doubting he has his best, my best interest in mind. It could be doubting whether it really is truth worth applying. I think a big doubt for us is trust putting God completely in charge. I think it, some of the doubt is I like some of what God asked for me, but not all of what he asked for me. And I think James is saying, if you're that person who you're gonna go down like it's a cafeteria and say, I like this wisdom and I like this wisdom, but oh, not that wisdom, not the Brussels sprout wisdom. No, not that. Like if we go through that, I think you're doubting and you're gonna be blown and tossed, double-minded and unstable, tossed around like you know, a leaf in a wind, in a windstorm, in West Texas windstorm. You must believe. What does that mean? It means I'm gonna trust him enough to put him first in my life and no matter what he asks of me, the answer is yes because I have valued that more than anything. And when I kind of read this through and I read it through numerous times and we read it this last week with my small group on Friday morning and you know, to me, there's one statement that I realized, like this was my takeaway for me. To pick up God's wisdom, I must lay down my own. I've got to say, God is wiser than me. He knows what's best for me. He's in charge of me. So if God asks me to do it, regardless of my knowledge, my opinion, or my desire, I will lay down my wisdom. I will lay down my plans so I can pick up his. That is a tough thing to do. Because sometimes God's wisdom is gonna go against what you think makes sense. Sometimes God's wisdom is gonna go against what you really want. Sometimes gonna, wisdom, God's wisdom is gonna ask you to do something that costs you something. And James would go back and say, remember, when you face trials of many kinds, keep going, keep growing. Sometimes the trial we face is the internal trial of, am I really gonna do exactly what God wants to do or am I gonna do what I wanna do? Am I gonna be selective in the wisdom that I apply 
or I access and I live out. To believe, and this was James's deal, is trust God enough to put him first and do what he asks no matter what. Build your house on the rock. I don't know what your next step is, but one of the things we believe at Live Oak is everybody always has a next step. James would say your next step would be admit you need wisdom and ask God for it. But after that, what will you do this week? What is your next step to seek out God's wisdom? I don't know what you said on how far you were from a scale of one to 100 in terms of how wise you were. I would just warn you, we're probably not as wise as we think we are, but no matter where you are, we probably all acknowledge we're not there yet that God wants to grow our wisdom. So what is your next step of how you're gonna pursue that this week? How you're gonna seek out God's wisdom and how you're gonna live it out. And one thing I want you to think about is where is something that God is asking you to do that's really, really hard right now? Either because you don't want it or you're afraid of what someone will think of you. You're worried about what it will cost you or what it means for you. Because I would just maybe make the, argument that that point is the place where faith in God should drive you to take a step because those steps where you're not sure if you want to, you're not sure if God can, you're not sure how it's going to work out. But if God asks you to do it, to trust him, to lay down your own wisdom, you have to do that first so you can pick up God's. But once you have God's wisdom, it's not something you have, it's something you live and it's something you do. Let me pray for us now. And as I do that, would you just do what James said? Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom for your life. Ask it for the people around you. Think about the people around your life and think about your plan for how you're gonna pursue wisdom this week and ask God to actually grant you the wisdom he's promised. Let's pray together. God, thanks that you love us. And you don't ask us to go through life blind. You actually, not, you don't just give us your wisdom, your wisdom only. You give us yourself you promise to be with us always and you walk it with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow. God, as we do that, we recognize you are wise. All wisdom from you is good and perfect. But it's also sometimes very difficult. It costs us something at times. God, help us to have a deep trust in you to follow you no matter what to lean not on our own understanding, but to trust you and in all our ways acknowledge you. God, we ask for wisdom. You promise to give it generously to anyone who asks, but you also said that person who asks needs to have faith. They need to believe and not doubt. There are many reasons we might doubt. Help us identify what holds us back. And God, give us the faith to take a step and to take that bold step of laying down our wisdom so we can pick up yours and laying down our life so we can pick up yours. God, thank you that in this exchange, what we lay down is worthless compared to what you offer us. Abundant life, godly wisdom, and your presence with us each and every day. There's some people in this room that are going through difficult circumstances. I pray you'd give them wisdom. Surround them with godly and wise people and remind them of your presence. And thanks that when we build our life on you, we can stand the storms of life. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'll see you next week for part three of Everyday Faith, 9.30, 11 in person, or 9.30, 11 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. online. Thanks for joining us.